Well, so uh, economies, of course, communicate with each other what their central banks are doing through things like uh, trade flows and exchange rates. And so to talk about those, uh, we have one of the foremost experts in the U.S., Professor Catherine Mann, who can't figure out how to get up to the flat. Here she comes. With the technology working, yes. Professor Mann. Uh, right, so I'm uh, I'm the uh, the global the global economy expert here, and so what I'm I'd, this is still a, a program about U.S. monetary policy, so I certainly want to add that uh, dimension into my comments. But I want to start with uh, looking at you know what do the um, international trade data and what do the international capital flow data tell me about the conduct uh, uh, of the U.S. economy and uh, what policy uh, is doing and, and maybe should do. So um, I want to look at some real side observations, looking at the real side of the economy, giving me uh, some picture on whether or not this uh, more evidence of more robust growth is something that I can observe in the trade data. Then I'm going to look at the financial side and uh, ask whether or not the, uh, there's indicator on the international capital flow side for a return to more normal market conditions when we look at them from the standpoint of the foreign investor. And then we're going to put that package together uh, with some implications. So um, I like these contributions charts. Um, you'll see several of them. And because uh, they, they do give me an insight on where the U.S. economy has been growing and where it may or may not be poised for growth going forward. So you have a couple of perspectives here, some averages uh, from the 2003 to 2007, a couple of years in the middle, and then we go to the quarterly data up until the most recent release. And each one of these colored components is a component of GDP. It's a contribution chart, so it adds up to GDP growth, which is in the dot, uh, the black dot. And uh, the ones that I look at uh, in particular, of course, are the green, which are exports and its contribution to growth, which is about a percentage point over the historical period. And in 2013, it looks kind of good, like um, maybe uh, exports really are going to be an important contributor going forward, particularly if we look at Q3 and Q4. The other thing I look at, of course, here is the uh, kind of modeled red, which is imports. Now, usually in a growing economy, imports, of course, are also growing, and so they're a negative contributor to GDP growth. That's why they're kind of below the zero line in the uh, high growth period. Uh, but if we're looking at 2013, we're looking at kind of a surprise, actually, in the sense that these uh, uh, contributions from imports are really, really small. And so what does that mean about the strength of the U.S. economy going forward? Um, there are a couple of other things in there that are interesting that have been mentioned before. Uh, the light blue is to PCE, personal consumption expenditures, and its contribution to growth. Um, it looks like it's kind of back to where uh, quite, quote, normal might be if we're comparing the two sides uh, of the chart. And then the other component being business fixed investment. Um, I use the uh, equipment and intellectual property, uh, E and IPP, so it does not include structures. Uh, structures are in a little um, purple dot. Uh, and uh, business equipment um, kind of looks like it might be back on track, again, but only if you look at Q4. So if I take this picture, um, I say, well, we're really dependent on the Q4 data to be persisting into uh, 2014 if this evidence of a more robust economy that's really going to take off, is that going to happen? We know the first quarter data is going to be really, really bad. Um, I think, uh, Stu, you were sort of saying one and a half or something. Well, Macro Advisors, of course, has come, is, is projecting um, about 0 0.5 to 0 0.7. So, you know, the question about Q1 is, first, will it beat the spread, whatever that is, at the spread meaning positively, and so and not tank the entire prospects for 2014 growth based on the first quarter being so bad. Now, you know, a lot of people in the first quarter are talking about all sorts of reasons for why Q4 is bad, and it's like, or Q1 is going to be bad, it's the weather. But every single year, I was just Googling back there on my, on my phone, every single year from 2011 onward, there's been an excuse 
for why the, the economy has not been growing faster based on our, collection, our monetary policy in particular. But you know, there's always a headwinds. And true, government spending is a huge headwind. Those are the gray bars. They've been a huge headwind, subtracting from GDP growth. But every time we think that there's going to be more positive economic activity, there is some reason for why you know, the tax or sequestration or the debt ceiling or Obama being reelected or now it's the weather. I mean, it's always something. And so that's why I say Q1 is going to be very important because either it's going to set the tone for a more positive 2014 or it's going to be yet another reason for why our hopes are dashed for a more um, robust economic uh, progress in 2014. Um, so now let me talk about what the international data might tell us about the prospects for A, beating the spread in, the 20, in 2014 Q1, and then going forward. So um, on the export side, these are again a set of contribution charts, the same sort of construction. Uh, in terms of the way they're designed. Uh, the two factors that, uh, two components that I look at in particular, and all these are gonna be up on the, on the website so you don't have to take pictures because it won't come out anyway. Um, so looking at uh, Q4 there, you'll see that, um, and actually Q1, 2, 3, that the very large component is food, feeds, and beverages. Uh, you know, it, it's the end of the year, you sell stuff, um, and it's a very big component in every quarter. It's not going to persist into Q1. The other uh, component that actually isn't on there, but is the reason why the dot, which is the export growth rate, is actually above the set of bars, it's because there was a lot of travel exports. In other words, a lot of tourists came in Q4. Uh, and the whether or not they're going to come in Q1, probably not, because, of course, it was bad weather. Um, so going forward, Export growth that we've observed in Q4 is not likely to be as large as what it, what it, it was uh, or has been uh, estimated in terms of contributing to GDP growth uh, overall because the two major components, travel and, and food, feeds, and beverages, it's an end-use component, those are not going to be as strong going into 2014. The categories that we depend on for, for ongoing strength are business uh, services and IP services, that's intellectual property receipts, which is the teal, uh, which as you can see is usually a relatively large component, about a percentage point or so. You don't see much of that at all happening in, Q, uh, in 13 and probably not in 14 because the market that goes to is the industrial country markets, and particularly in Europe, and I think this is a case, there was a gentleman who was asking about the implications of the Ukraine. It's going to make the uh, recovery, uh, prospects for recovery in Europe that much more difficult because in the midst of everything else going on, they've got this political problem and potentially even something worse uh, right next door. Uh, the second major component that we depend on for a strength in exports going forward is capital goods, except automotive, which is the uh, orange bar. And as you can see, that's dead in the water also, except for one quarter in last, uh, last year. And again, that's because those products principally go to the advanced industrial country markets, or they go to some of the emerging markets who, of course, are going through some difficulties, particularly China, but also Brazil, uh, in terms of uh, maintaining their pace of growth uh, in the face of the unwinding of US monetary policy. So. Um, now let's look at the import side. What, does imp what do imports tell us about prospects for U.S. growth going forward? Well, the major component of our imports, of course, is consumer goods. Consumer goods, which are in the dark blue, and um, autos, which are in the hash blue. And as you can see, historically, those have been very important parts of what we import. Um, now, if you're, in a, if you're a retailer and you're selling consumer goods, you're going you're gonna to be buying them now, and bring them in now if you think the consumer is going to be coming into your store. And rather than import those consumer goods imports being robust on the expectation of a robust consumer in 2014, it's opposite. Uh, and in fact, in some of these years, the annual data, negative contribution, which is that meaning a negative uh, growth in consumer goods imports, it's unheard of. 
not in U.S. basically economic history uh, of the most recent sort of two decades. So I don't see the prospect for a robust consumer if I'm looking through the lens of an importer. And since I'm the one who's going to sell it to the consumer and I'm not buying it, that says something about business expectations going forward. We can tell a similar story about business investment. Um, there is, it's a little bit more positive than that the capital goods component, which again is sort of in the yellow color, that that's a little bit stronger. But if we look at the dot, the dot is import growth, real import growth, and it's weak. You can't get around that. It's extremely weak. So imports are not evidence. I, what I see from my import data is not evidence of a robust economy in 2014. So um, there is a persistent and durable relationship between imports and US GDP growth. It's called How Tacker McGee because it's named after the two guys who wrote the first article on it in 1969. And it basically has been that same relationship has been found uh, all the way up to a paper that I did a couple of years ago with, uh, with one of my colleagues. And it's basically if US, imp if US GDP growth is about 2% or 2.5%, then import growth is 5%. And that two to one relationship has been persistent in the data since the post-war period. And it's even stronger if we look at consumer goods, where it's four to one in the short run, four, four, uh, four times the rate of growth of, PC, of, of consumer goods imports to PCE. Okay, that's where that, that's where that really robust relationship comes from. So here's the data for where we are now. Uh, 68 to 2010, um, you can see the GDP at about 3%, import growth at 6%. Okay, there we go, two to one. What do we see in the far column for 2011, 2013, based on the quarterly data to try to give as much weight to the most recent economic activity as we can? It's not there. It's one to one. And you can go down and look at the PCE goods or autos where there's a little bit more action going. Like the auto companies are in good shape, but nobody else is. And so this extremely robust relationship that we've observed in the data, as I say, since the World War II, has completely disappeared from the data. And we can go back through history, and is, it a, is it a turning point or something like that? And it's not. It's, it's something that, has, that has, has been taken out of the data. And understanding that, I think, is a really important question. It not only has implications for understanding the relationship between imports and GDP growth from an arithmetic standpoint, those contribution charts, but it also has really major implications for understanding what global growth potential might be. Because of course, if they can't sell to us, then global growth is, is going to be smaller, going to be lower than we otherwise expect, which of course will then feed back to reduce our potential for exports to drive the US economy going forward. Um, so now I want to turn to uh, financial matters. Um, so there are a couple different ways of looking at the financial, uh, financial flows, and I'm going to give you a number of different ways to look at it. But one is to look at uh, net flows, net cross-border flows. So this is the net of purchases and sales across the border, looking at U.S. purchases of foreign assets in the blue and foreign purchases of U.S. assets in the red. And you see the very big um, run-up of uh, added liquidity, robust cross-border uh, risk-on uh, activity, high liquidity, high leverage, up to 2007. Of course, you see the financial crisis. And then the quarters recently, you know, we have not really returned 
to the same kind of cross-border activity on that. Um, we're back into kind of like the pre-2000s in terms of cross-border financial activity, suggesting, yes, the balance sheets and everything have been uh, re reduced, but it also means that, that our whole risk attitude and taking cross-border positions seems to have moderated quite substantially. So another way to look at this question is um, to look at gross flows, okay? So what this chart does, let me uh, get over here so I can actually look at it. Um, what this chart does is um, compare what U.S. purchases of stocks and bonds are in the blue line and the blue dotted line. So this is the U.S. taking exposure abroad. And it's comparing that to what foreigners are buying in terms of gross flows. So it's one side of that previous diagram. So the gross flows in stocks, bonds, and of course the dotted line is U.S. Treasuries. So we take away from this chart a couple of observations. Uh, the first observation is foreign purchases of U.S. Treasuries to add to their portfolio dominate uh, their overall uh, behavior in the U.S. marketplace. The second observation is that uh, foreigners kind of like our stocks generally a whole lot more than our corporate bonds, which is kind of interesting because there are a lot of good AAA corporate bonds out there that foreigners don't seem to like for some reason. I have no idea, but they don't. Um, seem like they're leaving a lot of good money on the table uh, and instead buying stocks. So the third observation to take away from this chart is to look at the most recent set of quarters where you're seeing a dramatic decline in foreign cross-border activity, whether it be in treasuries or in stocks. So foreign retrenchment from uh, activity in the U.S. market in purchasing U.S. Uh, stocks and in purchasing U.S. treasuries says something about risk attitudes dampened abroad. It might also mean, it might also suggest that they don't think we're a really good place to uh, park their money anymore. So um, these two are way too detailed to talk about. Uh, they'll, they'll be on your other, they're supposed to go away actually. Um, so I want to turn now to uh, talking about uh, the implications of the U.S. Treasury attitude, foreign, or foreign purchases of U.S. Treasuries, uh, relative to those other uh, assets that they buy, uh, and link that to monetary policy. So the first um, observation that I want you to take away from this chart is uh, this looks at uh, the foreigner's portfolio, and it divides their portfolio up into what they hold. So, um, oh no, excuse me. This is, is, this is the U.S. marketplace and how important foreigners are in owning U.S. assets. So approximately 50% uh, of all U.S. Treasuries outstanding are owned by foreigners. Um, about 22% of oral corporate debt, which is a purple, and uh, 12% of equity owned by foreigners. So even though foreigners don't seem to like equity so much anymore, um, and they don't seem to like bonds as a gross flow, it is a larger component of their portfolio. But the largest co uh, component of uh, the most important uh, role that foreigners can play in the U.S. marketplace and, and how their changes in attitude could have an implication for the United States is through their behavior in the U.S. Treasury market since they own 50% of all the treasuries. So um, who actually owns those um, assets? Well, this is a net flow. This is net flows for U.S. treasuries. And um, the hatched bars uh, in the um, orange, uh, and we're looking at a more recent time period and a little bit more detail on recent quarters. The hatched bars are Asia. 
that's our traditional, whenever we think about the foreigners buying U.S. Treasury securities, we think Asia, Asia. Japan, China do hold a lot of U.S. Treasury securities. They are large um, net buyers. But I think it is interesting, two observations to make in most recent quarters is, um, first, uh, Europe in the blue, the set of blues, official and private, becoming much more important uh, players in the U.S. Treasury market, trying to find, if they're going to have to buy sovereigns, let's buy something that's relatively safer uh, in the U.S. And the other group is um, the purple, which is CFCs, Caribbean Financial Centers. Caribbean Financial Centers have become a relatively larger player in terms of net flows. Um, that's foreign because, of course, it's outside the U.S. borders. But it's not foreign in the sense that most of it's U.S. money that is sitting there uh, in a tax-advantaged state. Um, and so if we're trying to think about um, who is going to be playing a very big role or potentially a big role in the uh, evolution of U.S. Treasury yields, we need to look at ourselves because that's uh, a major player in the U.S. Treasury market through our tax advantage jurisdiction. So we all know that China owns the most U.S. Treasuries. Japan owns the next. Actually, Belgium now owns number, is, is in the number three uh, spot. I think it's because Euroclear is located there, but I think it's a very interesting question to go look at. And the Caymans are right there next after that in terms of holdings of U.S. Treasury securities. The last, uh, observa the last point that I want to make about understanding the cross-border uh, market uh, for Treasury securities um, and thinking about how it uh, intersects with monetary policy is this colorful chart. Um, so there are a number of different data sources that we have for U.S. Treasury, uh, uh, cross-border Treasury activity. Um, this one uh, comes from the Treasury itself. It's data that's on a monthly basis. It's the tick data. It's kind of hard to use. Uh, the other ones were from BEA. So what do we have in this chart? So we're going back to 2003. It's monthly data up to January. The dark line is a three-month moving average of the uh, total cross-border purchase and sale. So it's cross-border purchase and sale of long-term U.S. Treasuries, private, uh, and um, I've drawn in some red uh, indicators that match up to the announcement dates for the various monetary policy programs, uh, QE1, QE2, TWIST, which of course did not expand the balance sheet, and so you saw a huge decline in cross-border activity, and then QE3, which bulked up the balance sheet again and bulked up cross-border activity. Uh, taper talk there in May, which caused it to uh, come down again. And then the actual taper activity uh, does, didn't seem to like uh, reduce cross-border activity nearly as much as the talk about it in May, the previous May. So who is it that is responsible for most of this cross-border activity? And I put these numbers up here. They're uh, $4.5 trillion a month. Um, which, is, which is, seems to be at least a, large enough to kind of consider. It's on a monthly rate. Um, it's not the countries that we normally pay attention to. There are two lines down at the bottom, blue and red, and those are China and Japan. They play no role, effectively, in what's going on on a, on a gross cross-border basis. The reason why I focus on cross-border purchase and sale activity is it's going to contribute to volatility in the market, volatility in treasury yields um, as cross-border traders take advantage of small arbitrage opportunities. And who are they? They are uh, the French, actually. I'm listed here, the euro area, it's kind of the teal, the top of the bar, the stack bars underneath. That's actually all going through France. It's not the French. It's going through France. There's a geographic center. 
Um, the uh, green is the UK, which of course is, could be anybody. But again, the blue, the dark blue there is us. Us going through the Caymans. And it accounts for about a third of the cross-border activity um, in any given month, and sometimes larger than that. So, in other words, to, to really take account of the kinds of volatility that we're going to be seeing in the U.S. Treasury market as uh, we move towards a more normal monetary policy stance and all of the communications issues along the way that have already been discussed um, in the previous um, panels, yes, the cross-border activity is going to be a very important indicator of investor um, outlook, and uh, within that, um, our own Cayman subsidiaries are going to be a particularly interesting group to look at. So I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, time for questions. It's lunchtime. Everybody's got to go. <laughs> no questions. Mickey, you can yeah. always count on Mickey. Wait till we get the microphone. You didn't mention um, the recycling of the OPEC oil mm -hmm. money because it's all denominated in dollars. My hunch is a lot of it is in the UK, but could that also be in the Euro next in, in, in Euro Belgium? Euro -Clare. So yeah, well, certainly um, the, where, the, where the Middle East is putting their money, it's not in the US anymore. It's in some other place, right? Um, and uh, sure, it could be through the UK. Um, I do think that the, uh, the fo following, following the money into Belgium will be a very interesting exercise for somebody to do, you know, for somebody who's in the private sector and really has access to the, kinds, the kind of um, firm level data about where the source of the money going into Belgium is, uh, because Belgium as a number three holder of U.S. Treasuries now, I mean, you know, that obviously just begs, begs to be looked at. Other questions? Looks like you're off the, off the hook here. Oh, was there a question? Oh, the gentleman right there. Wait, wait till we get the microphone. If uh, you're projecting imports are way down, yeah. uh, suppose demand was really much stronger for those imports, will that be inflationary? So, you know, the, the question about whether or not demand is, ends up being inflationary is, is ultimately about what substitution cap characteristics you might have. So, you know, um, the categories in consumer goods for which there are substitutes um, is, you know, pe people have, I think people wouldn't buy them, frankly. I don't think there's enough pricing power on the part of the um, sellers into the marketplace to be able to price their products high and generate inflation from that channel. I mean, I'm a, I'm a you know, my model of inflation is, is uh, tightness in labor product markets, uh, commodity price pass through, and unanchored inflation expectations. And, you know, I'm not seeing any of those right now. Very quick question. Quick question. Thank you. Based on the work that you've done here, if you roll up your, your analysis into, let's say, global GDP growth estimates, mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, since 1970, GDP growth has been, global GDP growth has been about 3.6%, plus or minus. Mm -hmm. Would this be consistent with normal 3.6% growth? Do you see it above that or below that? So the, um, the most recent data on global growth has actually been for much higher growth than that, sort of in the fives. And that has become what we believe is, is like the kind of global growth that, you know, lifts millions out of poverty and all this kind of good stuff. And the most recent um, IMF World Bank meetings, you know, they're retrenched on, on those kinds of numbers down into the four and a halfs. So, you know, it may, I don't know if 3.6 is the normal number, but that's not going to be a number that's going to feel normal to most, to, to the global economy. That's going to be a number that is that is recession. It, it growth recession would be growth recession kind of numbers. Is that consistent with the 3.6 percent number? Or do you expect to be higher? 
I, well, since I think my, my numbers, my international perspective is very much on the modest side for U.S. growth. It's, you know, more on the low sort of two and a quarters type. So that, roll that up to they can't grow because we're not growing and they're not growing so much themselves anyway. So you're closer to your numbers, yeah. All right, can we have a round of applause for all of our great speakers? They'll be here probably for a few minutes, so you can probably catch them and uh, ask them some more questions. Uh, so here's kind of what I heard, I think. I heard that the U.S. economy is going to underperform. Uh, that, was, that was Stu's forecast, even though he's optimistic. is still optimistically underperforming. Uh, <laughs> We all kind of conclude the Fed can't really fix the things that we think are causing the underperformance. So what the Fed has tried to do and other central banks is to offset that somehow with the tools that they have. Uh, but in trying to do that, they've put us in unknown territory. We have no idea uh, what will happen now as we try to uh, normalize whatever that even means. We're not sure what that means, but we certainly have many challenges ahead of us as the economy does try to right itself and to grow, and how the Fed tries to figure out its role in a very different economy with a new set of regulatory strictures imposed on it by, of course, the Congress that ultimately has uh, created uh, the monster from Jekyll Island, right? The the, the Federal Reserve. So I want to thank all of you for coming today. I hope you've learned a lot. Uh, I hope you weren't too confused by it because it is complicated, but I think we uh, lear learned a lot about the complications and the implications of uh, what the Fed might, uh, what Fed policy might look like as it tries to uh, renormalize itself. We have a, a lot of other good programs coming up. There are uh, materials available out, out front. You should uh, join us for those sessions. You'll find them very interesting as well. Thank you all for coming. If you aren't a member of GIC and you'd like to join, we'll sign you up. And uh, just want to say uh, to our chairman, uh, George Chichekos, you built a beautiful building here. Congratulations to you. It's very nice facility. Thank you for hosting us. I, th I think it's terrific. Thank you. And oh, okay. If, where's Mike going to get here? Our program chairman. Yeah, uh, you can go to our website and look. But the the next uh, key upcoming meetings, we have a uh, a May eighth meeting in London, England. Uh, will be on uh, QE or not QE, and. Uh, <laughs> It's basically a look at uh, the emerging markets, currencies, and monetary policy. I, to do that. Uh, I am being told to remind you all to fill out this survey, which you'll find in the booklet. Uh, then we have the uh, Rocky Mountain Summit in Jackson Hole, which is on July 11th. Uh, and uh, it's a one-day meeting. I believe we have three Federal Reserve presidents that will be in attendance, so it will be a great meeting. Uh, and we are right now looking at doing a, uh, a New York meeting in September, a Canada meeting in October, a uh, Korea meeting in uh, November. So if those are of interest, please stay tuned to the GIC website and we will have dates posted as soon as we have uh, anchored those meetings. Uh, yeah, there's an ETF meeting in New York on May 19th. And it will be a, a half day looking at the ETF uh, industry and its impacts. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.